good evening, everybody from Bangladesh. Uh, welcome to this uh, nature-based solutions session at the first Gobishana Global Conference. Uh, as you know that the title of this session is Nature-Based Solutions to the Causes and Impacts of Climate Change, Strengthening Knowledge and Capacity. This session is jointly organized by International Center for Climate Change and Development uh, at, from Bangla in Bangladesh. University of Oxford, uh, more specifically its project Nature-Based Solutions Initiative, uh, uh, based in obviously in the UK, and Institution of Peruvian Studies in Peru. Thank you all for joining us, especially our colleagues uh, uh, from the, uh, and participants from the Americas, who, uh, where it is quite early morning, I believe, so, uh, and uh, from Australia and Pacific, where it is quite late at night. I am Hasib Mohammed Irfanullah. I'm an ind independent consultant working in the environment, climate change, and research system sectors. Currently, I'm working with uh, ICAD and uh, University of Oxford under the Nature-Based Solution Project, and we will be hearing about this initiative uh, uh, a bit later. We uh, all are more or less aware of nature-based solution because it has been talked about a lot. Although the concept sounds a bit new the, the terminal, in terms of the terminology, but we have been practicing nature-based solution for centuries, in fact. Um, when we talk about uh, conserving ecosystems, whether it is natural or uh, modified, when we protect it, when we sustainably manage it, or we extend it. Uh, but uh, when we do all these things to uh, uh, overcome some societal challenges, like disaster risk, climate change, food insecurity. Uh, but we have to remember nature-based solutions, since it is solutions, so we are talking about overcoming challenges. But the uniqueness of nature-based solution is it is not only benefiting human well, uh, humans only, but also biodiversity, ensuring ecosystem integrity. We will be hearing these issues a lot uh, over the next hour or so. But this, but today's session will be focusing more or less on knowledge and capacity issues uh, around nature-based solution. We have divided the whole uh, program event in two parts. First, we will be hearing presentations from our colleagues based at, at uh, Oxford, Bangladesh, and Peru. Then uh, we will be uh, listening to our panelists from Bangladesh as well as Peru, and we will be having question answer session as well. So before we uh, start listening to presentation, uh, let me uh, request uh, Professor Salimul Haq, Director ICAT, to welcome you all. Professor Hawk. Thank you very much, Hasib. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, agreeing to moderate this uh, session and thank you to uh, the co-organizers from Peru and from Oxford uh, for uh, agreeing to co-organize this with us. So let me start by giving you a little bit of uh, uh, the background to the Gobeshana Conference itself, uh, um, how we got here, what we are doing, what we hope to achieve, and then a little bit on uh, the topic that we are going to be addressing. Uh, so the Gobeshana Conference, for those of you who are not familiar with it, and also for those of you, particularly our friends from Peru who may not be familiar with the word Gobeshana, it's a Bangla word for research, and it is also the name of a platform that we created seven years ago here in Bangladesh, bringing together researchers, universities who are doing research on climate change and uh, in Bangladesh, primarily based in Bangladesh, but we had an, a number of international participants as well. Uh, right now, that platform has more than 50 universities, research organizations, NGOs, uh, government organizations, and others. And one of the things we used to do is every year in January, we had a big conference. We had several hundred people over four days at our university, the Independent University Bangladesh in Dhaka. Uh, we would have sessions, um, plenary and, and uh, uh, parallel sessions in a traditional conference setting. Um, and that went on uh, for six years. This year, as you know, with the pandemic, uh, we have decided to go virtual. Uh, and because we've become virtual, we no longer need international participants to fly to Dhaka to participate in a physical conference they can participate from wherever they are. And we then appeal to all our international friends and colleagues and partners, whether they would like to do a session. On the theme, the theme we chose is locally led adaptation, 
which is how can the most vulnerable people on the planet in all countries be enabled, supported, and in, involved in leading adaptation efforts at the local level, not just being targets of adaptation, but actually the leaders of adaptation. Uh, so that's the theme, global theme all over the world. And we got a huge response and I'm very pleased by the response. We now have 90 sessions, uh, which we are now doing over seven days and we are running the sessions 24 hours. Uh, so we have sessions in eight hour segments, the first eight hours for Asia Pacific region, then the next eight hours for the uh, Africa and Europe uh, 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 geography uh, continents, and then another eight hours for the Americas continents. And we, we've already done a 24 hour cycle. We are now uh, uh, nearing the middle or the late evening of the second day, and it's going very well. Uh, we've had uh, uh, more than uh, 10 sessions already, a lot of participation from all over the world. I'm, I'm really proud of the enthusiasm by which uh, everybody has joined. And this particular session with colleagues in Oxford in the UK and colleagues in Peru is a good example where we can bring together people who have been working together on this project, but in this format uh, to share with us without having to fly to Oxford or Dhaka or Peru uh, for having a project meeting. Uh, we can do it virtually. And so uh, I, I thank you for doing that. Now, let me talk a little bit about the topic of nature-based solutions. This is one of the major uh, topics. I don't know if you've seen the word cloud that we generated for the different 90 sessions that we have. The biggest word cloud was obviously locally led adaptation. Most people are, are doing that. But the second biggest word cloud was nature-based solutions. And uh, quite a few sessions, in fact, several sessions that I participated in already are looking at different aspects of nature-based solutions. And so we hope that one of the things that will come out of the conference at the end will be uh, some sort of way forward for us to collectively join forces and work together uh, on the different things that we are doing, but doing them in a bigger umbrella of assisting and working with each other going forward. And I've asked my colleague, Tashfia, who is the sort of coordinator for most of these uh, to sort of be the thread linking up the different sessions. And I'm sure I'm pleased to see Roki Bull and Muklis and uh, uh, Amdad here from the other sessions. They can also bring their experience. And one of the things I'll ask you to do, unfortunately, I won't be able to stay till the end because I have to go off to another meeting, another session, uh, is to, at the end, do a little bit of uh, brainstorming around what to do next. How can we take this forward? We don't want this to be just one, uh, one meeting and then everybody goes home. We want this to be a meeting that starts an uh, effort. That's why we call it a 10-year journey. This is the first year of the new Govashana format, the global Govashana. Uh, from now on, we are going to keep it virtual. We're going to keep it global. Every January, uh, we will meet and take stock and hopefully we will uh, continue to expand our work and learn from each other and help each other do uh, our work more effectively going forward. So that is the intention of uh, going forward. Uh, and the last thing I will say is that the issue of loss and locally led adaptation is intimately linked with nature-based solutions. In fact, in the past, before we started using the phrase locally led adaptation, we used to use the terms community-based adaptation for this kind of locally led adaptation and ecosystem-based adaptation for what is now called nature-based solutions. So CBA and EBA uh, were, have always been integrally linked in past uh, sessions. We have put them together. The language is just slightly different now because there's new sort of global language emerging, locally led adaptation, nature-based solutions. I, I have no problem with that. Let us embrace the new language, uh, but uh, we con the content is, as Hasib says, not, not something new. And we should also be planning to continue our uh, collaboration going forward. And the final uh, uh, point I want to uh, emphasize for uh, the participants here is that we have already with uh, uh, Professor Seddon from Oxford uh, uh, set up a nature-based solution uh, network platform. Uh, it, it's uh, hosted by Oxford University, but it has sections on Peru, a section on Bangladesh. So there's a Bangladesh network there, nature-based solutions. I invite anybody who's working on nature-based solutions in Bangladesh to take a look at the website and provide us with your information. We want to populate it with examples of people who are doing 
activities that are qualify as nature-based solutions and put them on the map, put them on our, on our website so that people who are looking for examples can find them in one place uh, on the nature-based solution website. Uh, so with that, let me uh, uh, thank everybody for joining this, particularly the speakers and uh, hand over back to Haseeb. Thank you, uh, Professor Hawk, for your uh, welcome remarks. Uh, you have uh, shared with us the overview of Gobishana, uh, Gobishana Global Conference, the first one, uh, and how it evolved uh, over the last uh, seven years or so. And thank you very much for uh, linking locally, uh, locally led adaptation with uh, CBA and uh, ecosystem-based adaptation with nature-based solution. I think many of us are still familiar with those terms. Uh, well, thank you very much. Now let us uh, start the first part of uh, our session, the presentation. I would like to request uh, Professor Nathalie Seddon, the Director of Nature-Based Solutions Initiative at University of Oxford, to present uh, her keynote speech. Professor Seddon. Thank you very much. Um, good, good, good evening, and um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, thank you, Salim, for your words um, and the introduction there, Hasib. It's a great pleasure to be taking part in this discussion. Um, so, um, to set the scene, I'm going to start by defining what we mean by nature-based solutions and outlining their potential for addressing the challenges of climate change mitigation, adaptation and biodiversity loss, whilst also enabling us to build societal and economic resilience as we recover from the COVID pandemic. So um, over the past two years, we've seen um, a really quite rapid growth in popularity of the concept of nature-based solutions to climate change in government spheres, in, in policy, and amongst practitioners and in businesses also. But it's very clear to, um, but it's very important to be clear on what we mean by good nature-based solutions. So put very simply, nature-based solutions involve working with ecosystems for societal good, as has already been explained. More specifically, they are actions that involve the protection, restoration, and management of semi-natural ecosystems the sustainable management of aquatic systems and working lands, such as timberlands and croplands, or the establishment of new or novel ecosystems in and around cities or across the wider rural landscape. But very importantly, these are actions that support biodiversity and are designed and implemented with the full engagement and consent of, of local communities and indigenous peoples. Um, because it's only in this way, as I will argue, that nature-based solutions can secure the flow of all these really important ecosystem services um, that underpin sustainable developments, uh, including human well-being now and critically for future generations. Now, the concept of nature-based solutions is very important uh, for many reasons, and I want to outline these. It represents a relatively new framing of our relationship with the natural world. Rather than regarding nature as being very vulnerable to human activities, they are instead recognized as a major ally in the fight against global change. And the concept is, is, is very powerful because it is for the first time bringing together communities of researchers and practitioners and policymakers working in fields that were working independently from one another. So I'm talking about the world of climate change, biodiversity loss, and critically, um, development. Now, the concept is rooted in the understanding that ecosystems support human societies in multiple ways, you know, from providing food, clean air and water and shelter, to storing carbon and protecting us from the impacts of extreme events and natural disasters, with which, of course, Bangladesh is extremely familiar, disasters such as flooding, droughts or heat waves. The concept also arises, and it's important to understand this, that biodiversity loss and climate change share some of the same drivers and hence share some of the same solutions. In particular, land use change for industrial agriculture is both the biggest driver of biodiversity declines, accounting for about you know, approximately 30 percent, and the second biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, accounting for around 23 to 24%. So in theory, at least, addressing land use change through nature-based solutions can both slow warming and arrest biodiversity declines, at least in terrestrial ecosystems. 
For example, there is a growing body of robust evidence that protecting coastal wetlands and reefs, for example, can protect us against storm surges, saltwater intrusion and erosion. And recently we've seen the value, for example, in Bangladesh of the Sundarbans in protecting communities and agricultural lands and properties against the impacts of storms. There's also evidence that protecting and restoring inland wetlands, so such as the whole wetlands in northeast Bangladesh, can help with flood abatement. Um, growing evidence also that the improved management of working lands or aquatic systems can stabilize or even in some cases enhance agricultural outputs in more variable climates, both during floods and droughts. And in Bangladesh, you have floating agriculture, floating gardens is a really important example of this. And then the fourth type is the creation of new ecosystems. And by that, we mean green and blue infrastructure in cities which can help with cooling and flood abatements whilst reducing air pollution and providing a large number of both mental and physical health benefits. Um, and no note that such actions, not just, um, they don't only reduce the exposure and sensitivity of communities to the impacts of climate change, but they can also build social capital and build capacity to adapt to future change through the very process of implementing nature-based solutions. So um, in addition, such actions that I've described, if they're, properly, if they're properly implemented and meet guidelines for good nature-based solutions, they can also help or contribute to mitigating climate change by protecting or enhancing carbon sinks whilst reducing emissions from land use and sea use change. So according to a recent study led by Dr. Cecile Jaridin, who is from the Nature-Based Solutions Initiative in Oxford, if we scale up globally nature-based solutions to the maximum extent possible, then we can reduce the total amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by around 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. The most significant contributions for cost-effective avoided emissions of carbon dioxide come from uh, protecting intact lands, while managing working lands provides the greatest contribution to the global carbon, carbon sink, followed by restoring native vegetation. Now, this is a very significant amount, but the important thing to remember is that this can only be achieved in tandem with the decarbonisation of our energy systems with keeping fossil fuels in the ground, in other words, because if we don't, warming beyond one and a half to two degrees will damage the health of our natural ecosystems so much so that they will no longer be able to draw down and store carbon. So nature-based solutions, um, another very key aspect to bear in mind is they can be very low risk and involve low implementation costs. Um, according to various recent studies, and there are a growing number of these, the benefits of mangrove restoration, for example, benefits around fisheries, forestry, recreation, and especially disaster risk reduction, are up to 10 times the costs of implementation. And there's also other studies that show that uh, nature-based coastal defence projects, which are very, very relevant to uh, the Bangladesh context, are between two to five times more cost effective compared with engineered structures. Now, nature-based solutions, there's growing evidence that they can also help stimulate the economy and provide you know, uh, economic re uh, recovery potential, for example, by creating jobs as well as providing a sustainable source of income for local people. For example, according to one study, for every one million US dollars invested in coastal habitat restoration in the USA, 40 new jobs are created. Now this compares to 19 for investment in the aviation industry, seven for finance, and critically only five for oil and gas. Now, as a result of the growing evidence and awareness of the potential of nature-based solutions for addressing both climate change mitigation and adaptation, and also addressing the biodiversity crisis, Nature-based solutions, as many of you will be aware, have been gaining traction in business and in government um, in recent years. So over the last 12 to 18 months, dozens and dozens of uh, new pledges and funding streams for nature-based solutions have been announced by countries and companies. And in late 2020, the Leaders' Pledge for Nature was launched, launched at the very first United Nations Summit on Biodiversity. This pledge, which was actually spearheaded by the UK government, has now been signed by 83 nations, including Bangladesh, all of whom have committed to a cooperating and holding one another to account in their joint mission to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. Now, while such commitments are really encouraging and may indeed represent a shift, a significant shift in governments and businesses, few of these pledges define clear and actionable plans for implementing and verifying commitments. 
And the, one of the big problems is, is although well-designed nature-based solutions can deliver multiple benefits for nature and also people, a lot of the recent limelight, as you're probably aware, has been very narrowly focused on tree planting for carbon sequestration. So it's almost like it's a silver bullet solution, which it's not. And we're very worried because not only is this distracting from the need to keep fossil fuels in the ground, um, and protect intact ecosystems. But the expansion of commercial forestry framed as a climate change solution is in many parts of the world coming at the cost of very biodiverse, very carbon rich ecosystems and is threatening livelihoods, well-being, and the rights of local indigenous people and communities across the world. Now to address, address these challenges um, and to support the, the scaling up or the evidence-based scaling up of successful sustainable and equitable nature-based solutions. We established a nature-based solutions initiative in 2017. Now this is a, an interdisciplinary program of policy advice, research and education, which is based at the University of Oxford. It brings together a variety of different sorts of scientists, social and physical and natural scientists, together with economists and governance experts. And its broad mission is to enhance the understanding of the potential of nature-based solutions to address global challenges and to support their implementation worldwide. Now at the Nature-Based Solutions Initiative, we fully recognize that we can only learn so much from published scientific research. And actually there is a huge amount of understanding about how best to work with nature within countries and especially at the local level. Um, and we recognize that there's a really important and very urgent need to bring together and share different forms of knowledge and knowledge needs from a wide diversity of different people, different communities, different stakeholders from across the science policy and practice spheres. In other words, there's a great need to establish so-called in-country communities of practice. Because it's only by working with these communities can, that we can hope to scale up successful nature-based solutions. So the establishment of such a community of practice in both Bangladesh and Peru over the last year, I think is vitally important. And so I'm really thrilled that Nature Based Solutions Initiative is working with such amazing teams in both these countries um, and including with ICAD. Um, the mission of the teams is very similar and it is overall, it is to enhance awareness and understanding of the potential of nature based solutions to address climate change and other global challenges and to support sustainable development and increase the implementation of these projects across the countries. And this is really critical, as you'll be aware, tropical and subtropical nations like Bangladesh and Peru are home to a very high proportion of the world's biodiversity and store much carbon across their varied and rich ecosystems. Bangladesh and Peru also contain rich bodies of knowledge in their diverse local communities and indigenous peoples, many of whom, as has been mentioned, have been working with nature for millennia. You know, the world has much to learn from these countries, these peoples and their ecosystems, and these communities of practice provide really important platforms through which that knowledge can be shared and built upon. Bangladesh is already doing a lot of work in this space, but there is a huge potential for scaling up nature-based solutions across the countries, within its cities, um, across many of its different landscapes. And I do believe that this could really play a vital role in helping the economy of Bangladesh to develop sustainably, whilst also tackling both the causes and consequences of climate change and biodiversity loss. And we'll be learning a bit more about how that is going to play out or has the potential to play out in the following presentation. So I feel greatly privileged to be here today and to be working with you all and from learning and to be learning from you as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sudden, for your uh, excellent presentation. You have uh, quite uh, well, uh, quite nicely uh, gave us an overview of nature-based solution, the benefits we receive from it. And uh, thank you very much for emphasizing on at least the three uh, important points that nature-based solution is not there to replace the decarbonization of our economy. Uh, and uh, often we think of nature-based solution as a kind of um, focusing on single species, mile after mile plantation. Uh, that might uh, have some benefit, but not the way we are actually defining nature-based solution and seeking benefit. And finally, the importance of policy, practice, and knowledge. And thank you very much for mentioning Bangladesh and uh, Peruvian uh, work that is being done under the Nature-Based Solutions Initiative. That actually, thank you very much uh, for all these points. Uh, that actually brings us, uh, thank you. That actually brings us to the next presentation which will be uh, uh, jointly presented by Alison Smith, Senior Associate, Nature-Based Solution Initiative at uh, University of Oxford, and Tashwia Tasneem, Researcher, 
uh, under the Nature Based Solution Bangladesh project. Uh, I'm requesting Alison and Tashfia to present their presentation. They will be talking about Bangladesh uh, activities being done in Bangladesh on Nature Based Solution under the NBSI. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hasib, and thanks, Alison, for uh, sharing the screen. So Alison and I will jointly present on our work on NBS in Bangladesh, building an evidence base to support a community of practice. Alison, can you please go on to the next slide? Okay, so uh, in 2019 and in 2020, uh, we have uh, uh, engaged with a, a diverse range of stakeholders um, uh, and with Bangladesh Planning Commission as well. And, and one point came out very deeply from all these workshops, that is the need of having NBS database solely for Bangladesh to have deeper understanding of, on NBS and identify best practices. Thus, uh, International Center for Climate Change and Development and nature-based solutions uh, at the initiatives at the University of Oxford have jointly developed this nature-based solutions Bangladesh portal uh, uh, and, uh, and it, this portal has been launched uh, uh, last year on the day uh, uh, of International Day for Biological Diversity. Uh, next slide, please. So um, uh, as, as Professor Natalie already mentioned uh, in her uh, slide that our mission is, is to enhance understanding of the importance of NBS and to scale up their implementation in, in uh, our countries, so in Bangladesh. So let uh, I will now take a walk through a uh, little walk through the uh, all the seven tabs that uh, are uh, there in our portal. Next slide, please. So we have a, a, a case study tab where we would like to capture cases that are popular in Bangladesh, and we will we would like to promote all these examples uh, on uh, in uh, like as nature based solutions interventions. And we have uh, you can see that we have categorized every uh, interventions uh, and and break down with so many questions, and and we have tried to provide the facts and evidence that why we are uh, uh, identifying those interventions and and in as NBS. Uh, there can be debates, but yes, we 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 are open to it, and we we are look forward to having more cases. So, if you have any, please contact us. Next slide, please. Um, also, um, uh, we would like to. Uh, focus on building uh, an evidence base and the beauty of it is that we are focusing both on peer reviewed and the real literature and my uh, colleague Alison will uh, 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 do a bit more uh, deeper dive in this section so I'm not going into much detail so next slide please. In the policy section, we would gather information on the policy landscapes around uh, happening in NBS Bangladesh. So right now there is one policy brief available. You can read it through. And if you have any uh, more uh, thing that can be included here, please let us know as well. Uh, we are open to update. Uh, next slide, please. We also continuously share uh, news uh, that are regularly happening uh, in, in Bangladesh on NPS, any articles, any uh, news, any papers, uh, videos, and uh, uh, we actually upload those in our news section. You can also follow our Twitter handle uh, at the red in NBS Bangladesh to get more updates. And you can also tag NBS Bangladesh if you'd like to promote your work under our uh, platform so that uh, uh, that can be um, uploaded in our news and uh, next slide please and in our event play page as well because in the next slide you can see that uh, next slide please Sorry, Anissa. Sir. I don't know why it's not working it suddenly stopped working uh, no problem. So uh, in uh, you can also uh, uh, after the news tab, you, you can see the event section as well where we provide all the links for any upcoming events. So I'm just going to stop. So I'm just going to restart sharing. Okay, no problem at all. Okay. Can you just go to my final slide then? Then yeah. because that is the most important one. Uh, the the number nine slides. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. So uh, please, uh, everyone, uh, can you uh, uh, take a look in this slide uh, where actually we are inviting. Uh, uh, organizations and individual members to join our network and we would like to grow this network to gather ev evidence together uh, 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 to, to, uh, uh, so that um, uh, on the effectiveness of existing nature-based solutions projects 
Uh, and, and we have already um, uh, uh, worked with few of the partner organizations and individuals who have engaged with us, organizing webinar, hosting webinar, delivering lectures. Uh, uh, so we are very welcome and there is provision. So if you uh, would like to engage with the NBS Bangladesh Network, you can reach out to me. I'll uh, 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 put up my chat um, email address in the chat box and I'm, I'm uh, open to discuss. Over to you, Alison, to carry carry on yeah thank, thank you. you Tasvia so um, so we know that nature-based solutions have great potential for locally led climate adaptation in Bangladesh but there's a lack of evidence on their effectiveness which is restricting the uptake so for example most adaptation projects approved recently were traditional engineered solutions only 38 out of 329 recent projects use nature-based solutions so to address this evidence gap we've done a systematic review of the literature We've looked at both the academic papers and also non-academic reports on the effectiveness of, of nature-based solutions in Bangladesh. And we found more than 300 relevant papers, of which around 70 or 80 have good evidence of the impact of nature-based solutions on nature and people. So this work is still ongoing, and I'm just going to present the initial results from about 50 papers that we've analysed in detail so far. And a large proportion of the literature focuses on nature-based food production, um, there's also a lot on agroforestry and on protection and restoration of mangroves and other types of forest. Um, also creation of plantations and restoration and management and protection of a range of freshwater and coastal habitats. Some of the key examples in Bangladesh include protection and restoration of uh, a range of native forests and so mangroves, swamp forests, deciduous forests and evergreen hill forests. Different types of sustainable crop production, including conservation agriculture, integrated pest management, home gardens, agroforestry and floating gardens, and a range of freshwater, wetland and coastal interventions, including restoration of rivers, constructed wetlands, um, shelter belts, oyster reefs, and fish and bird sanctuaries. And especially important in Bangladesh is participatory management of natural resources, including forests and freshwater resources. We've, we found a wide range of different impacts, economic, social, and environmental impacts. Um, since the literature focuses on food production, that's one of the main reported impacts, food security, also climate change mitigation, biodiversity and flooding and soil erosion. And the vast range of impacts reported are positive, but there are also some important um, negative impacts and trade-offs. So I'm just going to focus on a few very quick examples of the evidence that we found so far. Conservation agriculture, for example, which is involves retaining crop residue reducing tillage and having a high crop diversity can reduce the need to apply fertilizers, increase soil carbon storage and crop yield, and it can reduce irrigation water requirements by up to 33% and reduce fuel costs by up to 85%. And then home gardens, which are very common in Bangladesh, often have a really high diversity of different species of fruit, vegetables, um, and fuel wood and timber plants, um, almost as high as in natural forests in terms of diversity, although clearly using different species. Uh, the trees can also help to store carbon and protect from wind and storm damage. But um, by, by combining local and scientific knowledge, the management of these gardens can actually be improved. So by having a year round rotation of different types of fruit and vegetables, annual production can be doubled, um, improving nutrition and household income and providing additional employment and empowerment for female family members. Mangroves are really important in Bangladesh. They, they protect over 1 million people from coastal flooding during cyclones, and they avoid more than one and a half billion dollars worth of damage per year on average. And even just a strip of mangroves 100 meters deep can reduce storm surge velocity by 92%, saving the cost of maintaining storm embankments. And one study found that mangroves halved the average household damage from cyclones. Uh, river restoration is also very important. So, for example, the River Halder is vitally important for spawning, the only spawning ground of several major carp species. It provides very valuable ecosystem services, including fresh water for irrigation, household use and agriculture. Um, it's a transport route and, and very important for fish and fish fry for agriculture. But it's facing threats from pollution and overfishing. And com community-based management is a key method of reducing these threats and local people actually are very willing to contribute their time and money to help conserve the services provided by the river. 
constructed wetlands are another really important solution for improving water quality. So for example, pumping wetland water from wells, groundwater wells into wetlands containing river sand and bulrushes can reduce ar arsenic concentrations in groundwater right down to the safe limit. Swamp forests, um, community management again has been really important here for restoring swamp forests. So the villagers here plant seedlings and they help to protect those seedlings. They then share in the benefits from harvesting, sustainably harvesting the wood. And the forests also protect the villages from waves and erosion during monsoon rains. They store carbon, they increase fish, fish populations and they can boost biodiversity and ecotourism. And then hill forests in the Chittagong Hills are really important for protecting from um, storm runoff and erosion. So catchments with regenerating trees have three to four times less soil erosion and four to 35 times less nutrient loss, 16% less annual runoff. And the peak flow is seven times lower than for a catchment that had been cleared for agriculture. And local tree species are particularly good at protecting from sta stabilizing steep slopes from landslides. But there is a trade off here because many local people rely on shifting agriculture um, to provide food from those forests. So participatory management in general is really important for resolving those conflicts and trade-offs between, for example, um, food production and other ecosystem services. But, this, but a number of studies reported that this can be undermined by poor governance and corruption. So what do governments need to do to support nature-based solutions? Well, it's really important to recognise the non-market values of all these benefits provided by natural assets, such as mangroves, wetlands, forests and rivers in key national planning policies and also to provide financial incentives such as payment for ecosystem services, access to credit and practical training for people wishing to implement nature-based solutions. And then finally, to provide secure land tenure and land use rights and effective and transparent governance. So I'm going to finish there and just a reminder that when complete, this evidence base and the report will be on the NBS Bangladesh website there. Um, we hope this will be a useful resource for policymakers and practitioners. And for more information, um, the websites have already been posted into the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alison and Tashfia, uh, for sharing the nature-based solution web portal and uh, requesting to join our participants to the nature-based solution Bangladesh network. And thanks, uh, Alison, for uh, sharing the initial results or the trends we can see in the literature, both the gray and peer review. Uh, review journals, journal articles, and uh, sharing the examples. Thank you very much. At the end, you mentioned that why we need to, uh, uh, why we need policy support uh, to promote nature-based solution, which could be appreciating the non-market value of NBS, as well as investing in nature-based solution through incentive mechanism, and uh, obviously the land use right, and all actually brings into and uh, brings into uh, brings uh, governance into the discussion, which is so important when uh, practicing or promoting nature-based solutions. Thank you both. Now I would like to request our colleague from Peru, uh, Nicole uh, Nicole uh, Shabani. She is a researcher under the Nature-Based Solutions Project in Peru. Nicole, floor, floor is yours. Thank you, Hasib. I'm not sure if everyone can see my video, but thank you so much for sharing my presentation and for the invitation to present together with the Bangladesh colleagues and the Oxford colleagues on our work. As you can see, next slide, please. And as was said before, the Nature Based Solutions Initiative in Peru um, has the mission to support a growing community of practice on nature based solutions in order to position the importance and the potential of nature based solutions for climate action and thereby scale ambition in national and subnational policy, as well as public and private finance. Uh, next slide, please. We have two strategic objectives. The first is focused on gathering evidence from science and most importantly from practice. As was mentioned before, there is a huge gap on the evidence that can be collected, collected from practice on the effectiveness of nature-based solutions. And through this objective, we aim to build a knowledge repository and evidence map on nature-based solutions. Uh, we aim to also collate best practices, lessons learned, and very importantly, enabling conditions that allow us to 
um, have effective and sustainable nature-based solutions. And finally, to contribute uh, a conceptual and operational framework with guiding principles to guide the nature-based solutions that will be developed in the future and to also revise those that are in existence and to strengthen and scale them. The second strategic objective aims to take this evidence to increase the ambition for nature-based solutions in NDCs and other national and subnational climate policies, as well as research and public and private investment. Next slide, please. So we, we, we really quick want to share our approach on how we're uh, attempting to build this community of practice and synthesize this evidence. And of course, we have to recognize that Peru already has a strong and long trajectory building and working with ecosystem-based approaches, as well as a rich biocultural diversity based on its natural and cultural heritage. But we see that there is a lack of structured ev and a structured evidence base there is limited written and published works, and there is a very dispersed source of tra traditional and local knowledge that should be um, brought forth to, to influence the design of nature-based solutions. Thus, we um, have started to do the systematic literature review. We're using um, a framework uh, for develop for nature for development, um, developed by Oxford and its partners. And we are doing this to review papers uh, from the academic and non-academic literature. We also have conducted interviews with more than 20 practitioners and experts from Peru across a range of different ecosystems and types of nature-based solutions. And from these interviews and systematic literature review, we've started to compile case studies that bring together uh, different types of nature-based solutions that can be replicated according to the ecosystem type and the type of um, objective that is desired. And of, um, for now, the analysis and synthesis is still ongoing, but we aim to uh, publish results in the coming future. And some general findings that we can already share are that, in fact, we do recognize and we do find that there is a small percentage of work and experience that it's published and it's available for practitioners and decision makers to turn these evidence into decision making. Um, and then, of course, we find that even some of these uh, reports are not published in the institution's websites in a way that can be accessible for new practitioners. Uh, we also had to rely on supplementary materials such as thesis, reports, internal uh, and unpublished documents. So it really highlights the need for continued research and uh, research that can be uh, used and um, uh, applied in practice. We also found from interviews that there is uh, an awareness of the nature-based solutions concept, but it's still very gradually being used. Uh, the ecosystem-based approaches individually are the ones that have the most uh, application in practice. Next slide, please. We wanted to share a few of the preliminary results that we found. Uh, to start, as one of the most important aspects of nature-based solutions is to address societal challenges. We started mapping, in fact, how many interventions in Peru um, of the 48 academic papers and non-academic reports that we were able to review uh, address which types of societal challenges. As we can see, the, the societal challenge or issue of supporting local economies is the one that's most reported, which is a great uh, signal that nature-based solutions contribute to uh, sustainable development. We also see a big uh, contribution to climate change adaptation and to water security, which is a uh, two key issues in the Andes where uh, water resources are not scarce, but uh, with climate change, it will increasingly become so. Uh, we also want to point out that societal challenges are addressed that are addressed are not mutually exclusive. So we see a lot of combination. Um, and in fact, when we look at climate change mitigation and adaptation, we do find that there is a couple of studies that report on the synergies, but not as much as they should be reporting. So that's a, um, an open area of work for the future. Next slide, please. We also looked at uh, these societal challenges in terms of the, uh, the way they are reported. So many studies indicate that they do address these challenges, but they do not provide the evidence to support these claims. So they do not provide an outcome measure or an outcome indicator uh, and we see this across, as you can see here in the chart, where we see that in red, we mark 
that those that provide that state that they address a societal challenge, but they do not provide the evidence. And overall, it uh, outweighs all those who report on how they provide societal challenges with concrete evidence on on the way forward on those um, addressing those challenges. Next slide, please. So, in fact, when we're trying to determine which uh, inter interventions correspond to which ecosystem in order to then scale them and bring them forth to a community of practice in different ecosystems who are looking for an intervention that can resolve those societal challenges in the ecosystems they, they have. Uh, we see in, in Peru that most of the nature-based solutions interventions currently are being applied in the Andes region. Um, followed by in the tropical jungle and in the Yunga, which is the ecosystem that is on forests in the slopes. Um, and percentages also reflects this uh, proportion of having more in the Andes. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, then we also looked into intervention time. This is type. This is also very important because uh, different types of interventions will result in different kinds of solutions uh, as societal challenges and benefits being addressed. And we see that the, um, the greatest amount of interventions are those related to management. Um, and in management, we find that all interventions in the marine and coastal area are related to management, which is why it's so predominant. We also find a lot of restoration uh, that has been occurring in the Andes and in the Amazon. And we also highlight how there's a combined approach. So different interventions and ecosystem and nature-based solutions approaches combine both restoration, management, and protection in many cases. Next slide, please. So from the interviews, uh, it's, it's become very important to notice when it comes to a community of practice, what is needed. So we see that one of the most important requests is that the information to disseminate and exchange good practices, experiences, advice um, is highly valued by practitioners. And that is part of what a community of practice can provide. It's also important and has been requested that we have practical and applied approach to nature-based solutions. So this is very uh, aligned with the, the global standard for nature-based solutions, as well as the principles for all the individual nature-based solutions um, approaches. Then it's also been requested to have um, to have a platform to serve as a platform to make um, contributions, interlinkages, to have collaboration that can promote dialogue and coordination between different institutions working towards a common goal or working in similar ecosystems. Then there is a key uh, importance of having uh, science and policy articulate, so bringing science forward to decision makers so that 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 in the future, uh, new policies can be developed to strengthen and scale nature-based solutions, given all the benefits they provide. And of course, when it comes to collaboration as part of a community of practice, uh, one of the key areas of success would be to have an agenda with short-term periodic outputs in order to work towards this common goal. Um, and yes, other things that we've gained from interviews are that much of the information from projects is not captured on paper, which is why the practitioners have a big role in providing the detail and the objectives behind each intervention. Then we also see that there is um, a complementary aspect between what is published in science and what is captured in um, practice and how these two have to interact. Um, and then we've also been able to identify existing networks for particular nature-based solutions approaches that should be combined as part of a larger community of practice in the common concept. Next slide, please. And this is a screenshot from our website where we are showcasing some case studies that we've brought together based on a few criteria, for example, how frequent these types of interventions are present in our database. Uh, the available information that can be gathered uh, specific to respond to the societal challenges and the benefits we need to um, ensure can provide the effective and the benefits that we need from nature-based solutions. Also to reflect ecosystem diversity, as mentioned before, uh, Peru is 
hugely diverse. It has 39 ecosystems recognized and we need to showcase this diversity in order to have specific nature-based solutions aligned with those ecosystems. Also project duration uh, and to us, very important is the use of traditional knowledge. Next slide, please. These case studies were shared during the digital dialogues in October of 2020. The recordings are present or are found in our website. So if you would like to learn more about uh, nature-based solutions across four different kinds of ecosystems, please do visit our website and look into those YouTube videos. Uh, next slide, please. And just so you get a quick glimpse at what you could find, we have these four sessions, including a keynote session on global perspectives. And the four, the four keynote uh, sessions are on the Andes, the Amazons, the coasts and cities, and finally one on the role of nature-based solutions for the green economic recovery. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, we want to end with this message on the future of NBSI Peru is that we recognize there is a great foundation in practice of nature-based solutions, but there is a need to exchange best practices for monitoring, evaluating, and learning from these results in order to guide interventions towards the design of effective and sustainable nature-based solutions. Um, it is also an opportunity to convene, as mentioned before, existing networks that are specialized in different ecosystem-based approaches under the common NBS umbrella in order to have collective action. And we have defined this action as top down and bottom up. In the top down, we're looking at how the government requests can be met by practitioners, as well as how practitioners from the bottom up can bring forth the different challenges that are faced uh, in order to have support from the government. Um, and finally, I need to increase awareness of really the strong potential of nature-based solutions to uh, contribute to the green economic recovery, to sustainable development, to climate resilience, and to biodiversity protection all in one. Next slide, please. And for more information, you can visit our websites. Uh, they're listed here below. And I uh, just want to recognize that it's a team effort and constantly always under collaboration with Bangladesh and Oxford. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Nicole, for your excellent presentation, sharing with us the initial results from literature review as well as the interview. And thank you very much for emphasizing on uh, uh, strengthening the network to have a stronger uh, nature-based solution community in Peru, which we are also trying to do in Bangladesh. Thank you very much. So that uh, ends our first part of the, this session on nature-based solution. Now uh, I can see that uh, in the chat box as well as in the QA section, there are lots of questions coming in. Thank you very much for those. And please do uh, write in if you have any questions to our speakers or the panelists who will be coming soon uh, in the Q&A section. Now I'm handing over uh, to Alex uh, uh, Shoson, uh, who is senior researcher as under Nature-Based Solutions Initiative at University of Oxford to moderate the panel discussion and Q&A session. Alex, floor, floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Hasib. So, so what I'll what I'll do now. I hope everybody can can hear me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, what I will do now is invite uh, our four panelists um, who work on nature-based solutions across different contexts, and they'll have five minutes to share their opening remarks. Um, and then after that, we'll have 20 minutes to, to answer some questions and have um, a, a lively discussion. So um, if you are an attendee, please use the, the Q&A to ask questions rather than the chat. Um, as uh, that, that makes it easier for me to, to manage. And I, if I don't get to your question, I apologize in advance, but I, I will do my best. Um, okay, without further ado, I would like to first um, invite uh, Rakibul Amin, who is a representative from the um, um, uh, IUCN in Bangladesh, who will talk about the global NBS standard and its implication for achieving broader climate goals. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alex, and, and thank you, presenter, for very good presentations, um, Natalie. We have worked with a so uh, fantastic amalgamation of compilation of all the knowledge on the NBS and Alison and 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 Nicole experience sharing from 
um, uh, both from Bangladesh and from Peru. Uh, one thing that struck me in the, in the, in the this, this, uh, presentation is that both in Bangladesh and Peru, there are trying to, you know, what you call uh, document uh, the different practices and then try to fit in whether this is nature-based solution or not. And this is where exactly the role of IUCN with this national nature-based solution standard. Uh, there, there is, I mean, you know, as in the beginning, we have heard that there are, there, there are different approaches uh, we have been following, forest landscape restoration, um, say uh, other project area management, whether all of them individually, we can say is a nature-based solution, probably they are, and then maybe there is something new which, which we, maybe we are missing in the simplification of the definition of nature-based solution. Just to clarify, uh, the things we have been doing in the past, of course, is the best practices we need to do, but what is the little extra that we were trying to say when you say nature-based solution is the people and the nature together, where we're investing in nature for the sake of nature versus we invest in nature not only for nature, but also the benefit of the people. So it's combining this two. There's a little bit new, uh, I would say, a way of approaching the problem, societal challenges, and bringing the solution at the scale and matching the scale of the problem and the scale of the solution. Uh, this is where this IUCN standards comes in. So I will not uh, going to present the whole standard. It has eight, eight, uh, eight criteria, and you can go through that. That is with things that are available on the website. What is more important will be for the today's context is especially for Bangladesh, uh, ICAT, uh, uh, Nature-Based Solution Hub, and also Peru, is that it, we have developed what you call self-assessment um, uh, score sheet. This this step-by-step -step form uh, of the process will give you a kind of a scoring whether the solutions we are talking about are uh, at par or replicable at the scale uh, or what we can say is nature-based solution. I think this will be very important. Um, and also, uh, and, 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 and having that, I think what will be useful, uh, somebody was saying how, uh, I think I think it was Alison was saying how, how we can internalize uh, the, the issues like, you know, uh, valuation of nature. So, this is a very important part in, in, in defining this nature-based solution, how you ex internalize the externalities. And uh, the example given for Halda, yes, this is definitely fisheries. Uh, uh, I mean, in Halda in Bangladesh is a f fisheries ground for carp. Uh, so we have been protecting it. Whether this is a nature-based solution, in my opinion, it, we can, of course, say it's a nature-based solution, but it's more will be interesting if we can see the whole scale of the landscape or, or, or the watershed of the Halda and whether we can invest for the water supply in Chittagong, Chittagong City, which is, is now in the plan. Very similar way in the protected area in Bogota. Uh, the two protected areas, uh, Sinagaz and Sunapaz, and, and, and investing in that protected area or forest, uh, forest reserve is the, the water supply in Bogota is saving $4 million. So understanding this connectivity, the scale and, and, the, and the connectivity is, 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 in, in, is quite an important. I think this is a similar thing we need to do when we are capturing different case studies. Uh, Nicole has already presented that. But I mean, I would encourage to use the IUCN criteria and the self-assessment uh, guide, uh, uh, guideline. It will be then valid, I mean, it will be standardized. So uh, after publishing the global standard, IUCN is now moving into the uh, creating international standard committee, scientific knowledge committee, user group like us, and, and the national and regional hubs, which ICAD, uh, the, the hub they have ICAD has created easily can be, uh, uh, be uh, I mean, be part of it. Uh, and and creating standard is not, I mean, is not the end of the journey. So how you're applying the standard, I think more interesting would be is uh, how we can help these standards to design new kind of a project, new kind of a program for the practitioners, for the uh, bilateral donors and for the government. I mean, this is where I think this, 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 this the challenge is rather than, you know, 
trying to retrofit what we have already done, but going beyond that, how do we influence the new project design? And remember, at the scale to match with the scale of the problem. I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Rakibul. Um, that was very interesting. Now I'd like to, to, uh, to invite uh, Florencia Zapata, the, the Deputy Director of the Mountain Institute uh, in Peru, who will present on, on, on ecosystem-based adaptation as a strategy for climate change adaptation, focusing on, on local participation, effectiveness, um, and bridging dialogues between uh, local uh, or traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledges, as well as um, with scientific knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander, and good evening or morning, everybody. It is my pleasure to be part of this panel, and thank you very much to the organizer for this opportunity. As Alexander, you said, I would like to talk on ecosystem-based adaptation as a nature-based solution strategy for climate change adaptation, emphasizing two issues. First, the importance of local participation in the selection, design, implementation, and monitoring of adaptation interventions to secure their effectiveness and sustainability. And second, ensuring that local participation occurs through dialogue between local or traditional knowledge and scientific knowledge. I work at the Instituto de Montaña, um, where we have been implementing ecosystem-based adaptation since 2013 and other nature-based solutions since 1995 in mountain communities in Peru, in the Andes, using participatory methods particularly participatory action research. And the systematization of the experiences implementing nature-based solutions in Peru confirms the capacity of participatory methods to integrate the knowledge of local stakeholders and the technical and scientific knowledge of various disciplines and to bring local management practices and sustainable management goals close together. Uh, Participatory methods help to identify and understand from both local and scientific perspectives the current conditions, trends, possible future scenarios, and drivers of change that together are key to determining the vulnerability of communities and ecosystems, and thus selecting and designing adequate adaptation measures. Participatory methods also foster a dialogue of knowledge that helps ensure that ecosystem-based adaptation and other nature-based solutions are designed to be robust under both current climatic, environmental, and sociocultural conditions and a range of possible future conditions. This is especially relevant for ecosystem-based adaptation, which focuses on helping people adapt to climate change both now and in the future, with ecosystem health as means to adaptation. Importantly, participatory methods also lay the foundation for sustainable measures by generating a sense of ownership within the community. Local researchers play a fundamental role in the assessment stage and throughout the process of designing, implementing, monitoring, and maintaining EBA measures. Local partners assume leadership roles, which further consolidates the sense of ownership. It is therefore advisable to extend the participatory methods not only to the initial assessment, but to the whole intervention process. This, together with agreements regarding measure maintenance and monitoring through actions defining local policy instruments, provide the basis for sustainability of nature-based solutions. However, it should be noted that participatory methods is a terrain of knowledge and agendas in dispute. The EBA measures we implemented were not the result of consensus understood of the agreement of all people, but of a mediated dialogue and a process of collective decision maker. Agreement is reached as a result of exploring differences in reflective manner respecting the contributions of different perspectives and disciplines and creating solutions together. In this respect, it is important to pay attention to the attitudes and behaviors of external, uh, external facilitators 
and researchers and to ensure that they do not dominate the nature based solution implementation process. Thus, we recommend that knowledge dialogue be mediated and facilitated by the team trained in participatory approaches and methodologies. Ultimately, local stakeholders should be at the center of the nature based solutions and the decisions that are made. It is fundamental that we continually ask ourselves who controls and makes decisions, who undertakes the activities and who benefits from the results. Implementing nature-based solutions through participatory process requires time, perseverance, and above all, constant reflection, both individually and as a group. Our experience in Peru corroborates both the potential and the challenges of participatory methods and highlights the need to deepen and continue the dialogue of knowledge throughout the entire NATO-based solution experience. From, this is from our experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was fantastic, emphasizing the huge importance of social processes um, uh, for the, the, the effectiveness of NATO-based solutions. Um, now I'd like to invite uh, Mokles Rahman from the uh, from the CNRS, uh, who will talk about the, um, this is very fit, who will talk about the role of local communities uh, in delivering sustainable uh, nature-based solutions and, and with a focus on barriers and challenges um, and pathways uh, to, to, to minimize um, some of those. Um, so please, the floor is yours, thank you. Uh, all right, thank you, Alex. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Yes, I can hear you yeah. fine. All right. Um, well, uh, about the roles of communities, and uh, I think there are many things to share, but I just like to give some examples that I learned over 26 years working in different places in Bangladesh, uh, in the wetlands and forest context, uh, and also in the refugee context. Um, the thing is the communities should be, uh, they should be at the driving seat and uh, effectively participate in problem census and designing the action planning. Where uh, we often say about this, but in reality, uh, I mean, we always, you know, the practice is the other way around that we, the experts, we guide and decide and plan and uh, inform the communities and then we say the, uh, inclusivity and participation and all these things. Um, uh, the learning uh, points are like, you know, in one place in the Northeast where we have, we had these swamp forested wetlands um, where people used to say that, well, there is no jungle, meaning there is no forest, no fish. I was really wondering what is the link between forest and fish? So then they explained that swamp forest remains underwater for six months in the monsoon time. And this is a very big, very good fish refuse and habitats, micro habitats. And fish take shelter and lots of foods grow on the uh, submerged uh, branches and leaves. Uh, fish browse on that. And also habitat for many fish species that have sticky eggs, so they need substrate. So these are very important findings and then we, we focused on restoration of swamp forest because these were cleared by people and also the problem identified by the people. And uh, we have seen the lack of, you know, the policy protection to save this ecosystem components. And another place uh, in the year, probably, you know, the about 20 years back, the people were waiting. I had to work with the fishermen in a central Bangladesh and then um, used to do fish migration from river to flat plains. But unfortunately, the year was drought here. And no river water entered into the flat plain through canals. They said no river water, so no fish, particularly several commercial species of carps and river and catfish. They said we will be losing this year. So no river water, no flooding, no fish. Um, so these are actually you know, uh, very important and uh, guiding points for the planners. And in one place in the north, uh, the northwest, where 
the local people, uh, a mosque committee, mosque-based committee, they actually don't allow people to completely dry out the ponds in the floodplains. The aim is to keep some water for farmers. They work in the, in, in the dry season under the sun. They need some water and also water for cattle and also water for protecting the parent stock of fish. So these are all indigenous knowledge based, based on the long years of practice and the use of resources. So the role of community is huge. Even in the uh, uh, northeast of Bangladesh, where we had a very big US assisted wetland restoration project, where you know, our focus was mainly on water and fish and wetland dependent birds and other stuff, wildlife. They said, no, you have to go to the hill slopes a bit away because the hill slope cultivation practice is so bad that huge siltation is there and the wetlands beds are being raised and affecting the production system. So if you really want to uh, protect and improve and sustain the wetland productivity and biodiversity and community livelihoods, you are to also include the watershed and the hill slopes. Uh, and accordingly, uh, USAID accepted the community recommendations. So I think you can understand the role of communities in it. If they are given the opportunities and support and oriented and engaged, they really can, uh, can be the champion in designing and implementing natural-based solutions. And in, the same, in that same wetland, uh, for the first time in Bangladesh, uh, the government declared a permanent wetland sanctuary. And this, the project ended in 2006 and now we are at 2000, uh, 2021, the steel that sanctuary is being managed largely by the communities with a little and sporadic support of the sub-district level administration. Though there are some problems, but the system is, is still functioning. And last week I paid a visit there and I spent a whole day in the sanctuary. It's very interesting. So, I mean, the communities can better address the problem, can better uh, identify the problem, better address the problem, and get a, can better suggest how to do the NBS. So this is the role of community in summary. Um, the barriers, I think, to my experience, it is the uh, policy processes and in institutional responses, the measure barrier, well, uh, and the governance is there too. So the policy process and governance, I mean, is a big problem. Uh, particularly, Bangladesh is a wetland. I mean, we have lots of wetlands, um, also other types of ecosystems. Uh, but NBS is not in the policy. And the wetland management policy is extractive and exploitative. Uh, hardly any conservation is there. But through different projects with IUCN, World Fish, and other organizations, WinRoc, with donor-supported projects, we demonstrated uh, very successful, uh, I should say, um, uh, the natural-based solution approaches on the ground. Uh, we, we also had the monitoring program and we had the data to support the effectiveness. Uh, in central Bangladesh, another place that we just the people say that there is the, where people say there are no flood water coming in due to drought and there are no fish. There we, through a project funded by the Fourth Fort Foundation uh, back in uh, 1994. And after the establishing the connectivity and linkages with the nearby mm -hmm. river system, we have got six times higher fish production and 20, over 22% increase in the fish biodiversity. So these are really the practical examples. Thank you. So what are the, just a second. <laughs> so what are the, I mean, way out and, and, and uh, like, um, we need a very coherent policy and that support NBS and need to build the concept and capacity of all the stakeholders. Otherwise, I mean, we, we, we have to work with the government agencies. And so uh, they also need to have very clear understanding the concept and approaches. Approach is very important and also the con uh, concept that what is NBS and what are the benefits. So there are lack of you know, monitoring data, lack of uh, 
guiding notes and approaches. So I think it is again, now we're talking about uh, NBS globally and lots of you know guiding, guiding notes and papers, so things are available. So uh, uh, I think um, uh, the NBS will get a shape. And uh, lastly, I would like to say that in the, in the Cox's Bazaar area where I've seen is also working, um, we have been doing uh, the environmental restoration of degraded forest lands due to uh, settlement of the refugees. The 6,000 hectares or acres of area completely denuded, all the trees cut for making shelters. So huge scarcity of water, surface water, and loss of biodiversity and siltation. And due to hill cutting, there is narrowing down of the uh, channels. So we actually restored the streams. We widened and deepened, and the banks are protected with plant-based approach. <coughs> Sorry, I, if, if, if you'll excuse me, I just need to move on. Can we pick up on that point in the questions? Because I think yeah, one the, of the, the questions. The, the thing is the NBS actually, it works in, in wide area of settings to address mm -hmm. various societal and environmental challenges. And it is proven. So need patronization from the government uh, with the policy and process related support. So that's basically uh, my points and I like to end here. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. I think a few of the questions touch on some of those points. I'd like to move on now to welcome uh, Amdad, who, who is the Director of Strategic Planning and Head of Climate Action at Friendship, who will present on nature-based solutions and their role in protecting people and assets on, in coastal regions. Thank you. Five minutes, please. Thank you, Alex. Uh, uh, it's a prayer call uh, in our side so that uh, few seconds you may need to listen here. Uh, let me start with, uh, thank you presenters, very, very nicely they captured so many uh, burning issues, both from Peru and Bangladesh. And here I will start with Dr. Hasib's comments, the practicing nature-based solution is a century's experience uh, globally. And, but now in, uh, we are those organization, we are like friendship working in the ground. Uh, we are in a crossroad conserving nature and in other, in other hand, the conflict with nature. And let me share with you what the, what is the, I mean, reason behind why we are struggling this critical situation, you know, uh, because uh, we do believe recently, you remember in May, 2020, uh, we had to face cyclone Amphan and then, uh, Everyone recognized the mangrove forest acted as a natural barrier. We all realized this, but even though our data uh, from the ground uh, noticed this uh, around 40, we have conducted a study for 1200 families and uh, most of them around 48% they mentioned, they noticed 49% uh, that they noticed the, uh, the trees decreasing. And and we, we, we went into a bit deeper uh, situation and we learned, you know, if you realize the 24.3% among these 1200 families have no regular income. So that 24.3% uh, uh, have regular income and rest, they have very uncertain. So, uh, and out of this 24% and there are, you know, day labor, they are crab collector, honey collector, somehow uh, they have regular opportunity and everyone is actually, they have to find, they have to find their opportunities. And 75% of families in our working areas with these 1200 families, their annual earning, uh, monthly earning around uh, $100. And, you know, because they do not have opportunities to work, to get money, to earn, and 0.4% receive any income generating training. Considering this situation, when he asked the importance of mangrove, then they replied the wood is the reason behind, wood needed. And yes, definitely some many people around 28% replied mangrove work for their protection, but 51% replied, you know, wood, uh, the, the uh, you know, they get take wood from mangrove. And so this situation, uh, you know, uh, helped us to realize the situation and to design our program. Mangrove with the support from Friendship Luxembourg and with the Ministry of Luxembourg. And we started, you know, planting mangrove. Around 100 uh, hectares free we planted. And then we, uh, before the plantation, 
the you know the way natali mentioned the land use change and truly the land use is a big question and big challenge at this moment because of shrimp farming and some other other options the for by the business people and then we had to find land and this the was the first struggle to get the land and to manage land and then that land managing land and planting mangrove the major challenge appeared you know for our seedling because there is no seedling uh, opportunities in the areas except the government sources so we had to create you know largest private nursery for mangrove seedling and before starting this plantation we spent around 5 to 6 months to help and to help community to understand the importance of this mangrove plantation to to help community to realize the nature based solution what they ha- they inherit their indigenous knowledge practice they they all realize but you know keeping them with those challenges you know alive is the is was our the priority then based on that we engaged them uh, to be part of the plantation program to be part of the seedling and the way alison and taspia mentioned in you know, participatory management each and every point we connected these people to design to create the you know plan how to protect mangrove tradition and how to align with their day to day income programs like fishing and some other things so these are the our the secret uh, for the success now 200000 plant uh, already the year and we are heading for several hundred hectares uh, plantation and now people we lost arm fund they truly realize the how the mangrove plantation protected them for uh, the uh, wave uh, for the flooding for these erosion all those things and they now involved in every process and finally actually i must mention the the way you know nikol from peru mentioned the you know the infrastructure link as yes local government forest department and the community friendship and other ngo those who are stakeholder iucn we connected everyone to be part of this mission and the way we are planning to proceed and to be part of this mangrove plantation in bangladesh in southern communities thank you so much Alex you're muted. Oh. Yes. Um thank you. I didn't um uh, I'm dad I didn't hear the last 10 seconds of what you said if you could just re- please please repeat that last point. Oh uh, that is the the way you know Nico uh, from Peru mentioned institutional linkage and we uh, agree with this the linkage between the local government forest department IUCN and other stakeholders and these was uh, this uh, the stakeholders connected for the same purpose and importantly stand alone a nature based solution program is truly very challenging and if you not connect with other other approaches friendship has a intervention in those areas so we we are head, we are you know uh, implementing program through a holistic approach health services education services economic opportunity services at the same time mangrove plantations when you people connect people with different aspects then you you will able to understand the crucial uh, challenges of those people in need thank you uh, thank you very much so now we'll we'll go into questions i think um uh we we're supposed to have 20 minutes but tasfiela we we might be having a bit less but i'll start with you on that we'll we'll just go backwards um uh you mentioned that that local communities uh that you worked with have recognized the benefits um uh, have you harnessed that to um has that led to um interventions being implemented in in other areas as a result of of perceiving these benefits have they worked with other communities to start initiatives in different areas yes we initiated you know you know shamnagar sub district in uh, shathira district and then we extended this program in ashashuni a uh, sub district then extended it with in you know, mongol sub district and we will be you know the you know in early days we listened you know that this is a barrier from the local level government or the communities but now we we are actually uh, getting the welcoming because uh, people are quite involved and you know because we spend time with people we actually uh, wanted to assess their what is the challenge they they rear uh, raise uh, goat sheep and they need a grazing field and when other ngos actually in the uh, few years before planted tree the goats actually 
uh, because of gods and they, they, this, this uh, plantation were disappeared. So we now uh, we identified some solution how they can get access to fill for their grass for interim period. You know, for sometimes they can have grasses, grasses from the plantation areas and they can lock the, because we created fencing. So, so that, uh, and we are actually finding other livelihood opportunity for those communities. And this combination, considering their, you know, different services, helping them to understand, bringing them in planning, and engaging them in the in the process process i mean the seedling plantation and they also act as a caretaker for the whole plantation areas around 100 hectares so uh, they recruited caretakers they identified caretakers they are taking care if any fencing you know broken or you know uh, torted so that uh, these engagement worked very very well and we introduced as friendship implementing so many programs we have a health program education program economic opportunity program we connected all doors for this integrated approach and we realized and we option you know the water crisis is a big crisis in southern part of the bangladesh we have you know water purification plant so when we connected all doors then people started trusting on us trusting on us and they actually engaged in day-to-day in -day programming. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. I think uh, I'm not sure how much we have time huge we have data, left. huge uh, uh, rural, uh, local level, you know, findings. You. Uh, we can have another program, another session to explain those. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to move on with a question that was posed in the chat. I think um, our partners in Bangladesh can can all co contribute, but it was directed to um, for Moklis. Um, it, it was an important point. It was it was that we need to maintain the momentum in these nature-based solutions. We need to include community voices, but community voices and knowledges are, are ever so dynamic and evolving, while programs are often difficult to, um, uh, can be, not always, but can be difficult um, to adaptively manage, particularly if they're large-scale programs. Do you have any any anything you want to, to say in response in response to that? How to um, how to bridge bridge the two to incorporate local knowledge? Thank you. This was for for Moklis, if if he's still on the line. Um, so, sir, we cannot hear you. Uh, I think we can move on. Uh, Okay, let's maybe maybe we'll get back to that. It does does anyone else from Bangladesh have any insights on that, or for actually in any context? Um, um, I think it very much relates to, to stakeholder engagement and how to adaptively manage programs to to ensure that they stay up to date with local knowledge. Maybe Florencia might have a point on that since she spoke about participatory approaches. Yes, thank you, Alex. Yes, exactly. Um, the, the, it is very easy to say, well, let's involve local stakeholders in the process and, and run a participatory process to develop a, a bottom-up, right, uh, implementation in the MBS process. But in fact, it, it is very time consuming. It needs skills from the teams who facilitate and implement. And from our experience, participatory action research process and methods are very powerful in order to involve local perspective and develop ownership. That's key, develop local ownership. Who will manage the nature-based solution, being EBA or other nature-based solution? Who, who will manage it after the project ends? Who will run and, and conduct the activities to maintain the nature-based solution? And who will... Uh, support the maintenance of the solution after the project ends and for that involving people from the very beginning from the assessment and giving them the power to uh, to to run and to and to lead the process that's key and that takes time and need a people trained on those participatory skills yes thank that's you no, thank you that's, that's very very important and that's often training at least in uh, in academia, such training is often uh, non-existent, yet it's crucially important uh, to implement nature-based solutions. So we definitely need to work with uh, practitioners very closely who, like you, have this experience. 
Um, I'd like to, to move on and I have a question um, uh, for uh, Rakib. Um, and I was wondering uh, what steps the, maybe you, I think you might have started discussing this, but if you could expand on what steps the IUCN is taking in Bangladesh uh, to build capacity for using the standard um, uh, or for promoting the use of the standard uh, for those that are, that are implementing or intended, intending to implement nature-based solutions. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, uh, so we rolled out um, this, what you call capacity building of our IUC and staff within ourselves, because to be a preacher, we need to be trained by ourselves. So that's part is done. And we are trying to organize uh, a few webinars. Uh, we have already done that. There is also a plan and also have, you know, training courses in IUC and probably will open um, what you call an IUC Academy. Um, so again, for the standards like NBS and also the different standards that IUC has created in the past um, to keep, uh, keep, on, keep the momentum on. We also have our, not necessarily IUC and staff has to do it. We have our commission members and Hazi, for example, is our commission member from CEM, who were the more, CEM is a commission in ecosystem management who were played a major role in developing the standards. So it's, it's I use it as a hub, not necessarily that we all have to do it by ourselves, but our extended family, the commissions and, and, the, and the expert uh, there, and Mokles is also our IUCN member, um, and so is Friendship, uh, Ahmed, uh, and Dadai. So, so together, we would we'd like to unpack it. As I said in the last, when in my last uh, uh, slot, is there is there is a fear in uh, simplicity. Uh, if you try to simplify too much, you can you may lose the potential of the potency of this this whole concept. And and there are has been some good practices in the past. Yes, of course. This is let's say for example landscape management. But whether we are doing the same thing and branded as a nature based solution, we will lose. Uh, uh, um, an important part of it. So that I think this is very, very important to understand. And that's where this, this standard uh, comes in. Um, uh, the principal evidence-based standards and guideline for the practitioners and also the decision makers. I think this is where the scale we need to, we need to reach. Um, I know, and also the partner like ICAN, Dr. Salimul Haq, definitely they can play this facilitator's role. To, to reach that to the decision makers, to make them understand it is not a business as usual scenario or a business usual, business as usual approach. It is something extra, little extra that nature and people put together and invested in nature for the benefit of the, of the people and vice versa. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. There's also a question in the Q&A about the standard. I think um, you might want to, to to, to see, check that question out uh, in full and type, you can type an answer, but it, it's basically asking about whether the standard is more for a label, um, you know, to certify the project or if it's more for uh, facilitating the development of a good project. Um, uh, my understanding is that it serves both purposes, but I'll let you understand that. Yeah. Answer that. Well, you, you're, you're right, it's both project, as I clearly mentioned. Um, you can use yourself as a spend guideline. What is more important is, is to facilitate new way of thinking, how you build this two sphere, people and nature. And as a, for any development project, it's a core benefit where, me, where biodiversity conservation happens as a core benefit or multiple benefit. Um, so uh, I hope we, we get our answer right. I, I can't see the question. Uh, anyway, if Tashvia can send it to me, I can, I can move. Uh, write it, or I can paste the uh, the website where you can find the nature based uh, solution standard and and uh, read it. And there are few uh, resource tools as well available. I'll 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 I'll, I'll, I'll paste those uh, you know um, links. Thank you very much. I think we have about um, four or five minutes left. Uh, is that right, uh, Sib? Yes. You're Thank right. you. So, so now I'll just I'll open up the floor for, uh, to the panelists. 
uh, that are with us to see if, if um, let me let me ask each of you if you if you you know having listened to to what you've all said, is there one take home message that you'd like to to emphasize and and share with with our attendees before we close the session? Um, I'll start with uh, well let's start let's go with um, Florencia to start with and then we'll we'll proceed amongst the the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, everybody. It has been a very insightful panel and session. Uh, just to be consistent with my message from the beginning, local ownership from the very beginning to the very end and after. Uh, and building that takes time and need uh, skills from the uh, facilitators and uh, social and environmental researchers who participate in the process. That's my take home message. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, uh, Mok is is Mokles back on the line, or is are we having trouble with the connection? Uh, we can't see him. Uh, he's think... having trouble because yeah. he's uh, okay. outside. Not Canada. a problem. Yes, sorry. Not a problem. I, I'd like to 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 open up the floor to to um, Dai, um, uh, to, to to give us one final uh, take home message. Yes, uh, I will. I will mention actually the you know for this nature-based solution, and as Rocky Bay also indicating, you know there are some issues behind you know socio-economic and cultural perspective, and that need to be considered and is within the program areas. But beyond program area, the donor policy both need to be flexible and you know the adaptive with with the, with the challenge because it's not really magic. Nature-based solution is a long process. It's not really, and you know, engaging people for that particular uh, ambition and bringing back their indigenous knowledge and the modern concept and the experiences. Uh, and everyone need to be in the same platform, donor, government, international community, and the uh, stakeholders, those are in ground. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, that's crucially important. We talk a lot about capacity building. Um, uh, for local communities or, 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 or um, uh, in, in the context in which the nature-based solutions takes place. But it's also critical to, to think about capacity building of donors who may not always understand what we're dealing with. Um, so uh, one uh, now uh, I'll open up the floor again to, to Rekibul to, 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 for any, any, any final comments before we, we close off. We, I think we have about a couple of minutes left. Um. No, I think uh, I'm just thanking the organizer and ICAD and especially Dr. Salim for taking this, this uh, leadership and what we are doing in Bangladesh in, in terms of what he is doing in terms of, you know, uh, LBS hub. This is the beginning and, and it is a fantastic leadership. So we will be working with them, um, with him and, and, and ICAD. And what is I liked about the session is that, you know, we need more connectivity between the practitioners, uh, community organizers, and the academics. This link is not always, um, sometimes it is a missing link, but this is more we have more academic and the practitioners link and we can reinforce each other's exp uh, experience and uh, better things will come out through this process. So session like that today or this today is exceptional, uh, fantastic, brilliant, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. I'll, I'll open up, I'll leave the floor to Haseeb now to close off the session. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much for moderating the session. And of course, thanks to all our four panelists for fantastic uh, remarks at the beginning, as well as uh, answering some of the questions from the floor. Mm, uh, thank you very much. I'll just take a minute. Uh, we have all heard uh, the discussion and uh, three, four points actually came up again and again. We have all heard that we need to put a local community in the center. The ownership is so important. And that kind of uh, matches with the uh, theme of this uh, Govishima Global Conference, locally led adaptation. We also understand that uh, we don't have, especially in the Global South, we don't have enough knowledge on nature-based solutions effectiveness. The concept is quite new. We are not linking it with other services uh, or other uh, benefits we, uh, we can give to our community who depend upon nature so much. That's why we need to build the capacity of un or understanding of nature-based solution, both approaches, concepts, 
the standards of IUCN, uh, as well as what Alex said, the capacity of the donor even to have a common understanding of what do we mean by feature-based solution. Otherwise, uh, as uh, Raki Bulamin has rightly mentioned, oversimplification or branding different things uh, in the name of nature-based solution could be, could be quite detrimental. Uh, and uh, uh, the other points that came up is network. We need to build a nature-based solution community, uh, which not only about the practitioner, practitioners, not only about the researchers, but bringing everybody together like we have done today over the last uh, one and a half hour. I thank uh, all the presenters uh, who participated in the first session, including Professor Seden, Nicole, uh, Alison, Tashfia. Obviously, uh, Tashfia uh, is part of the organizing team. She deserves uh, uh, applause from us. And the panelists and Alex, thank you all very much. And of course, Dr. Salim for for her for his uh, encouraging uh, welcome remark. That's all for today. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, all the participants for being with us. I can, I can tell you, all, everybody, that at the moment when it was a peak, we had 177 participants actually listening to it. Of course, many, uh, many dropped out over the last uh, half an hour or so, but it, it has been fantastic. Thank you, all the participants. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.